assalamu alaikum today uh, we'll try to continue from where we left off but before that i happened to come across these set of slides which oh, which seem quite relevant to our topic of discussion so we'll just take a look at it uh, briefly so that we could make a recap of whatever we have learned so far when i told you is concerned okay and later on um there's this bit about <coughs> an example a working example of neurological um understanding or neurological approach to understanding literature which we will do with the help of peter barry's book itself all right so moving on without wasting much time some students i believe still are worried about what neurology is just remember it is the telling of the stories okay narratology is a study that deals with how you tell stories what goes into the making of storytelling all right simply put that's what it means so there's a proper definition here the study of how narratives the stories make meaning and what the basic mechanisms and procedures are which are common to all acts of storytelling so in the study of narratology you look into the basic mechanisms and procedures okay basic mechanisms and procedures and, and they are made to seem rather technical okay so that you could separate it of course there are writers like eliot and uh, uh, em forster who try to use very simple terms non technical terms to um describe a certain facet of narratology but most of the narratologists whether it be aristotle or prop or genet or any other uh, narratologists um, who are not directly concerned with writing or with telling stories themselves they use highly technical language okay so uh, that's where the difficulty comes in that This, these technicalities they are made to seem more complicated than they actually are okay so and so uh, ultimately the uh, the idea is very simple these ideas are very 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 simple the only thing is they are made to seem a little technical a little more professional all right so also you have to remember that narratology does not concern itself with merely one text or a unique story by itself it 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 does not go into the interpretation of individual stories but is the attempt to study the nature of story itself nature of story is in how any story for that matter is told okay as a concept and as a cultural practice right how uh, how stories are told in a certain cultural setting what is the uh, basis or the foundation in which a story is created and expressed that's what narratology is concerned with so we have already discussed this story and plot how story is seen as fabula or a histoire and a plot is seen as sujet discourse recit right so a story would be the actual sequence as they happen the story has to begin at the beginning then move chronologically without nothing left out it is very much like what you have in for summary when you summarize something when you summarize a story when you retell or paraphrase a story this is how you go about doing it right you start from the beginning go to the middle and to the end you try to state the bare facts the minimum facts as to how they happened they are more sequential whereas plot is a version of the story that can begin in the middle of a chain of events and it can also provide us with flashback and flash forwards so generally most of the time the story does not begin at the beginning any story for that matter they begin somewhere in the middle or somewhere a little forward in time right and references are made backwards so you are given flashbacks flashbacks and and then you get hints of what is going to happen later on flash forwards as well right and a plot is supposed to be a version of a story see a story could be a simple thing that everyone knows but in the retelling or or, or on how a 
द सेम स्टोरी इज टोल्ड बाई फाइव डिफरेंट पीपल विल वेरी राइट will vary in the sense one person would make it really interesting other person would make it very very boring other person would be very straightforward in presenting and other person would make it so complicated that you wouldn't know where it started where it ended and what the concept was at all each have their own version of the same story right so that's what plot does okay plot is the version of a story as presented by the author the three main theories of narratology uh we could rather say that these were the sort of uh, trend setters during their own periods in the field of narratology aristotle vladimir prop gerard genet right we spoke of how aristotelian analysis they are propian genet analysis analysis of it. as far as aristotelian analysis is concerned character and action are essential in a story so they must be revealed through elements of plot so character is revealed through action so the prime importance was given to action okay so action is what makes a character according to aristotle and a character is revealed through three main elements in a plot okay um we spoke about hamartia we spoke about peripeteia and anagnorisis right so hamartia is a way is the flaw an integral flaw in the character especially in a tragedy and as anagnorisis would be the recognition or realization as in when the truth of the situation is recognized by the protagonist in a moment of self recognition it's kind of an not exactly an epiphany but uh, something very close to it he, re- he realizes at this point and ignorizes a point where the realization is made the self realization is made that something has gone terribly wrong now peripeteia would be the reverse of the fortune in classical um uh, in, in a from a classical perspective this reversal of fortune would be from a high fortune to a low fortune is it like from a high status to a low status uh, now peripeteia is alternatively used for a reversal of fortune that is from high status to low status and then from low status to high status that is uh, th- there is a, a complete cycle of uh, you know a, a person goes through a character goes through in a tragedy now propin analysis we've spoken about 31 functions and five schemes right um yeah sorry not five schemes i think it was seven yeah seven spheres of action seven schemas right so these 31 functions as we have seen earlier it could be variously applied but it is definitely definitely uh, no story no certainly no story could be possible without one of oh, one set of these um you know functions as such so every work every story has to have uh, at least a couple of functions from the 31 the, from the 31 functions as stated by vladimir prop all right so moving on so the, the seven spheres of action as in what we call characterization prop calls it seven spheres of action please remember it's not very difficult to understand uh, seven spheres of action is nothing but characterization as understood by prop now these characterization this characterization is not um it's it's almost stereotyped almost stereotyped in the sense like it is based on what function a character delivers okay so based on that uh, this villain donna help a princess or a sort of person or her father you know, the dispatcher hero false hero and we have spoken it, about it at length already so we won't uh, spend any more time on it now coming to genetic analysis we've done some three points i believe two or three points here yeah? see while aristotle deals with a theme and or the or the uh, theme of the story is in the, the how he deals with the narrative aspect 
from a philosophical or from a psychological point of view prop looks at the plot okay the plot of the or, or the structural aspect of um of a of a story of a narrative now janet you could say he looks more further further he moves on to the very uh, obvious level of the or the technicalities of the workings of uh, um, each aspect he includes plot in it dialogue in it uh, the time frame in it um, and what else perspective in it the characterization as well okay it is it is kind of like uh, he looks at different aspects that go into the making of a plot all right so he basically proposes six areas as summed up by peter barry so first of all the question is whether it is whether the narrative is mimetic or diegetic mimetic and diegetic we already discussed is a showing and the, and the telling so some parts are shown some parts are merely told related right because if all parts are simply told it would not look like a story at all it would look like a play a drama right so it it's necessary that some parts are simply told that we are just you know informed of and it would help us you know go through certain parts that are not really necessary or that do not add very much to the uh, to the action within the story right so diegetic is more panoramic uh, and summarizing without trying to show it as it happens before our eyes okay it's rapid telling mimetic would be slow telling then he speaks of how narrative is focalized focalized as in what the perspective is what the point of view is so um you have you must have already discussed um, or studied about um, various kinds of narrators like first person narrative omniscient narrative second person narrative third person narrative right we must have discussed about so many different kinds of narrator not second person sorry so speaking of external focalization that is from outside this is what we are familiar with as omniscient narrative right so external focalization would be of from the the point of view of a narrator who is uh, who sees from outside okay oh uh, and it focuses not merely on the the external aspects of uh, the character the external um, you know how they what they speak or what they say or what, how they act they external narr- <coughs> excuse me external narrative actually deals also with the you know the inner workings inner workings of the characters minds okay the thoughts the thoughts of the characters as well right so omniscient narrator may or may not be engaged you know mentally engaged with the characters within the story within the narrative all right so here's an example then must stood up and called out to mario external focalization from outside so she stands up and she calls out the speech and action internal focalization would be from inside focus on what the characters feel and think So Thelma suddenly felt anxious that Mario was not going to see her and would walk by oblivious on the other side of the road. Zero zero focalization, omniscient narration. It is focalization that is completely from the outside, right? So external external focalization mainly focuses on what the characters say and do. internal focalization focuses on the thought of a person or the thought of the characters it could be a single like the focus could be on a single character or it could be on several characters uh, it could be either way 
Now, zero focalization would be an omniscient narration that go that uh, that goes from uh, that move could that could move from one character to another. It could be external as well as internal, internal only in specific cases or sometimes in several cases. In several cases, as in it could maybe it could look into the thoughts of one character or it could look into the thoughts of several more important characters. We don't know. Right. Uh, moving on, who is telling the story? Another question Janet seems to ponder upon is whether the story is being told by a distinct character inside the story, or, 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 or if not, or is it an omniscient or zero focalized narrator? Okay, so uh, the so to answer this question, it could be zero focalization, as in an omniscient narrator, a narrator who is merely a voice, a tone, in the story, or it could be a distinct person, a dis- distinct person, as in how that person seems to. Sorry, how that uh, person seems to, how the character seems to be either a part, okay part of the story now again this could be uh, it could be an um, mm, homodiegetic or heterodiegetic when you speak of homodiegetic it simply means that the person is telling his own story as in it could be the central character who is telling the story or it could be a subordinate character the least important character or an outsider of the story i mean the story does not revolve around that person um remember moby dick ishmael right ishmael is not integral to the to the story itself to the plot itself but the voice is that of ishmael right the same goes for um lockwood right lockwood is not important for bronte's Uh, a story but we see the entire story from Lockwood's perspective right and again in terms of uh, where um, homodiagetic stories are concerned the story is told by the person himself the character himself it is his own story his or her own story now Pride and Precious we see from Bennett's eyes Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bennett's eyes right okay moving on how is time handled in the story so, so as we've already discussed this any work any story for that matter does not begin at the beginning they generally start a little after beginning otherwise what happens is very much, uh, is what you see in Lawrence Lawrence Stern's work it took some uh, quite a few books for the hero to be born right so um generally stories begin in the middle as in classical terminology what we call in media stress okay and they tend to go forwards and backwards moving um, backwards as in like flashbacks you get flashbacks would be what is uh, you know technically called analeptic or flash forwards as in proleptic analeptic and proleptic rarely begin in the beginning usually in the middle media in media stress as in how in uh, charles dickens novel a tale of two cities there is wide bloodshed i mean like uh, the the, uh, the barrels of wine um, are broken and like uh, they are flowing you know uh, flowing all over the streets right so it is it sort of hints at what is going to happen after the revolution after the revolution there is bloodshed all over the streets right again uh, remember jane eyre jane eyre where um, bertha mason rips apart the veil that jane is supposed to wear for the name for her wedding now it it hints it at a future where the wedding might not even take place the wedding might be stopped right so there is a flash forward going on there 
and flashbacks of course we are all familiar with flashbacks so many flashbacks all happen all the time so flash forwards generally are hinted at you're given a hint of whereas flashbacks are more adiagetic as in they are related then how is the story packaged as we have seen earlier in the oval portrait there is a frame narrative there is an, a main narrative frame narratives are primary narratives primary and primary narratives as in like they are the first narratives how it starts okay the story that sort of frames the main story i mean the f- frames the main story is in the, the picture is what is of importance right the frame is of secondary importance but the frame is required to hold the picture in place right so that's how it works the frame narrative would be the primary narrative it could be told by one person it could be told by several people uh, you must have seen plenty of those uh, those kinds of like uh, 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 there are examples could be found in the canterbury tales right or uh, uh, or you could look into the arabian nights or uh, or vikram vetal there there are so many instances of frame and meta narratives now these smaller narratives that are embedded in the frame are called meta narratives by genet okay so basically the frame narrative is a prime narrative primary narrative and the main narrative would be the secondary or the embedded narrative okay embedded secondary or meta or main narrative there are so many different nomenclatures attached to it now again this frame narrative could be single ended or double ended single ended as in like it may start at one point okay in the beginning the frame narrative could be the thing that uh, as in uh, for instance in oval portrait itself the army officer is seen right at the beginning right and towards the end there is no mention of the uh, army officer at all you are just left with the uh, with the death of uh, of this uh, woman in the portrait right again it could be double ended as well as in like uh, how in vikram vital you have vikram answering okay i mean um, uh, there is betal who is relating the story to vikram and 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 towards the end he poses a question a moral dilemma to vikram now vikram is supposed to answer back right he is not supposed to answer but then um if you are familiar with the story you would know that the moment he opens his lips betal would fly away once again right so we go back to the frame narrative the embedded narrative is completely closed on both sides all right so that would be double ended the frame of uh, the frame narrative is double ended in that case again um in canterbury tales again the frame narrative is double ended in the sense that there are uh, there is a main main narrative where there are the pilgrims all gathering together they are planning to go they are telling the stories and each story is a meta narrative of its own and there is a return there is a going back to the main story once the story has been relayed re- uh, related by a certain pilgrim we go back to the main narrative of the pilgrimage itself right so it is double ended as well and it could be sometimes intrusive as in there is there could be a moving forward and backwards like as in um, the heart of darkness heart of darkness marlowe's heart of darkness remember how there is uh, at every a oh, crucial point uh, after a very tense prolonged moment there is a moving back if there is a coming out of the story as in where the narrator seems to uh, you know ponder upon what has happened to some extent and uh, sometimes make a remark a simple remark as if like yes uh, now i know what is going to happen but back then i did not know right you know there is a sort of a lessening of tension in that case so that is that would be what you call intrusive uh, you know the 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 frame intrudes upon the secondary narratives okay secondary narrative or the main narrative or the meta narrative whatever you call it then how are speech and thought presented first of all it could be direct and tagged 
it could be direct and untagged it could be direct and selectively tagged now it could be indirect it's not mentioned in here but see direct would imply that the or oh, the dialogue is stated within inverted commas that it is mimetic mimetic as in it is as if you are watching it happen it is you it is you are watching it um hearing it happen okay what's your name mario asked her now mario asked her would be the phrase that is what you call tagging okay labeling tagging is nothing but labeling who is saying it is label who is saying it is mentioned here okay so this is the simplest form of representation okay so what speech could be formed framed in these ways first it could be direct okay within inverted commas the sentence could be placed which would make it more mimetic okay with appropriate labeling as in who says in what sense okay mario says in what sense he simply asked her is telma she replied so there is a question answer going on it could be direct and untagged as in what's your name telma now and this could be sort of confusing because uh, for the lack of labeling you see if it's just two characters um you may understand it to some extent but imagine there are several characters and if there is no labeling at all as to who is telling what it it could turn out to be quite uh, quite confusing so this could be used to create a certain ambiguity at certain point but uh, necessarily for the movement of a plot um it may not work that well then direct and selectively tag what's your name asked mario selma just it without any tagging okay so in the third case you it is direct but selectively tagged that is one uh, one part one instance could be tagged the other uh, in the other case it is uh, it is implicit that you know it is assumed that the other person is answering the question the f- posed by the first person again there are other ways of speech or representing speech and thought tagged indirect speech that is he asked her what her name was and she told him it was thelma now even though it is tagged even though it is labeled the speech is in the indirect form okay it is not direct it is not quoted okay now free indirect speech would be what was her name it was thelma thelma was it not the kind of name to launch a thousand ships more of a suburban lace cut and sort of name really now this is not tagged it is free but the assumption is that these musings are of a male mind right uh, it is not something that a woman would actually think when you look at a uh, look at a name uh, uh, only a man will be uh, thinking about how this name does not really um, uh, create any fancy uh, fanciful thoughts and a person could not uh, you know uh, these kind of uh, the uh, the assumption is that even despite the not tagging here untagged status of this sentence here still you get the understanding that it is from a male point of view from a male perspective so it's called free indirect speech so what do narratologists do first of all they look at individual narratives seeking out the recurrent structures which are found within all narratives so it is very much like what the structuralists do they look at one particular work and try to apply it to all other works and find uh, try to find similar structures recurring structures in all such different works they focus more on the teller and the telling disregard the content so they are not primarily concerned with content as is the case with uh, Aristotle or with um, Frog they f- their focus is mainly on the teller the narrator and the telling that is how it is narrated they take categories uh derived mainly from the analysis of short narratives which are expanded later on novel and narratives so they look into the categories uh, the categorize basically and try to analyze short narratives and apply it to novel length narratives okay so they don't really go directly for novel length narratives possibly they look into shorter narratives first and apply it to everyone the foreground action and structure rather than character and motive 
so their main focus is not on character and structure sorry action and structure but their main focus is on characterization what the character does how it does what the speech pattern of a character is okay and motive what the intention behind the character is okay no so oh, sorry i'm sorry they they don't really focus on those actually it is uh, um, aristotle and prop who focus on character and action sorry character and motive their main focus is on action and structure okay for a moment there i got it confused sorry so the uh, genetic analysis focuses on action and structure okay so um that is all there is to this these slides uh, inshallah i'll uh, pick up with an example of joint up narratology joint up narratology is where you bring in all the components different components of genetic narratology aristotelian and proper narratology along with the uh, the structural analysis um uh, or the the five codes remember the five codes priority hermeneutic all those codes five codes you put them all together to understand different aspects of a story telling okay so what you miss in one it can be uh, taken up by another um approach so it's called joint up narratology okay a mixture of all aristotelian propian uh, genetian or barthian as you would call it barth's codes uh, th- those codes were devised by roland barth right barthian narratology so you put them all together uh, to try to understand a certain uh, the, you know narrative uh, um approach so we'll pick up with that part in my next video hopefully i'll post it inshallah today itself so uh, just go through that once and uh, you'll be good to go for this one text i mean this one chapter thank you so much for your patient listening jazakallah khair allah hafiz